Hi, everybody. Uh, we have a huge crowd today. Uh, my name is Anthony Swin. I'm the director of the Data Science and Discovery Program at the Division of Computing, Data Science, and Society. Uh, today, we'll have our panels on uh, generative AI. It's a critical conversation on this revolution in technology. Um, this is our first panel, actually, in this format. And yes, um, yeah, but we, so this is a really exciting panel that we've put together uh, because we, we decided to put this together, frankly, because the development and adoption of these generative AI tools, such as ChatGPT, has been really faster than any other information technology that I've been aware of. Uh, many of you probably will agree that this probably is one of the biggest developments since maybe the iPhone or the beginning of the internet. So we put together this panel to really understand this phenomenon, uh, less so from the perspective of a gen, you know, artificial general intelligence or its impact on general society, but focusing more on kind of a UC Berkeley perspective uh, in terms of its impact on education, research, and IT infrastructure. So we will discuss a lot of the promising tools of, of generative AI, along with the commonly known uh, kind of issues that it presents, whether it's in data privacy, uh, to costs and equity issues that this tool, uh, these tools will unleash. So the panel structure will be about yes. 30 minutes or so. We'll be focusing on uh, the panelists will give short talks about their interests and learn, uh, kind of experience with generative AI. Uh, along with its uh, policy implications. Uh, uh, the, the person, please uh, turn off their mic. If you want to use that one. Is this Robert Hall? I think I saw flash up. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll edit this out in the final recording. Uh, so we, again, first 30 minutes, we'll be covering uh, panelist conversations about what, uh, what their, their learnings. Uh, a lot of them have already published works about um, generative AI and its impacts. Uh, the second half, the second 30 minutes, we'll be focusing on audience questions. So please put in your questions uh, throughout the talk, and we will I will ask the panelists these questions. And I'm sure the panelists will have questions themselves. Uh, now to introduce our esteemed group of panelists, uh, first is Camille Crittenden, uh, Executive Director of Citrus in the Pantanal Institute. She's also the co-founder of the Citrus Policy Lab and uh, EDGE, Expanding Diversity and Gender Equity in Technology Initiative at Berkeley, uh, at UC Berkeley and other UCs. Second is Janine Cohen. Uh, she's the Executive Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at UC Berkeley. Greg Merritt is a DevOps Lead at C3.ai Digital Transformation Institute. Um, all of your panelists have experience in technology, uh, education, and research, and they will cover their unique thoughts on that. So let's start off with Camille. Camille, you, can you give us an overview of your thoughts on generative AI, especially at the university level? Sure, thank you, Anthony. And thanks everyone for joining today. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Um, so the slot that I thought I could fill is perhaps to give a little bit broader context for um, what chat GPT might offer to areas of the academic enterprise outside of necessarily the teaching and learning aspect with Janae will talk about and maybe the more um, hands-on develop, developer aspect uh, that Greg will touch on. Um, but as you know, I'm sure everyone in the audience is pretty familiar with this advent of this new generative AI and based on these large language models that are being deployed for various um, contexts, various applications. Uh, and I think the most hand-wringing is over plagiarism and cheating. You know, I think especially here in the academy that professors and lecturers are, are tend to be upset about uh, the, those possible applications um, and trying to, to uh, have this sort of arms raised to detect plagiarism. Um, so there are other applications that are being developed around that. Janine will probably speak about it more. But I was thinking um, that I could say just a few things more about the, the broader potential applications of these kind of AI chatbots that might be improved and, uh, based on these large language models that we're talking about through chat GPT and other um, kind of generative AI uh, platforms. So I'm going to speak maybe to just three or four kind of large buckets, and then I'm happy to um, answer questions or, or follow up with more specifics if you'd like to drill down into some of them. Uh, part of my interest in this comes from serving on a UC presidential committee on responsible use of AI, and that project was devoted to four different subject areas. And the area that I uh, co-led actually with another um, colleague here from UC Berkeley 
was on student success. And so applications outside of the classroom, but on other ways that uh, AI can help students to be successful in their academic enterprise and just generally uh, to get through their years in college. How can we use AI to support them? One of these areas was in mental health. So you might have read about applications um, of chat bots to supplement, hopefully, or you know, even uh, take the place of some real live human therapists or counselors. So I think with the advent of chat GPT, that this offers perhaps expanded opportunities to assist uh, students or staff or faculty or anyone who's looking for mental health services, in part because those services are so constrained on college campuses, there are just not enough counselors available to meet the demands that's there. So even if these kind of automated responses could be used to, um, you know, triage or be like a first response that could then escalate as needed to the human professionals, um, that that might be helpful to alleviate some staff staffing issues and to provide better services to the students. Another uh, advantage of this in this particular context is that it's available 24 seven, you know, if it's automated that you don't have to have necessarily um, responses within a particular business hour. Uh, it's also in many cases available in different languages. So that also extends the capacity, perhaps, to provide that kind of um, support. So, of course, there are questions and there are concerns about um, privacy and transparency. Uh, there were I'll put various um, links in the chat as I go along, but uh, there is a, a news story where um, I guess ChatGPT had been used for uh, some mental health counseling and it wasn't presented in a very transparent way and so people were all up in arms about the ethics of that understandably um so i think that's really key is to be clear about are you talking to a real human or are you talking to an automated machine um, other studies have shown that in texting mental health like what's it called crisis text line um that there are some instances where even when the student, say, knows that they're talking to a chatbot, it still provides comfort <laughs> and provides some utility in that context. So I think there's a lot of interesting research to be done. Um, and also as far as kind of the marketing or sales of it, because I think when you ask people, would you like to go to a chat GPT therapist? They might say, oh, no, not at all. But if they say, would you like to interact with a chatbot? And sometimes they might say yes, like the, the way that it's being described, I think is not very uh, clear necessarily in the general public's mind. So anyway, that's one potential uh, application of chat GPT. Another just within the academy that would thrill me <laughs> is for just general administrative tasks. So say you're writing a grant proposal, um, you could put in the parameters of what you want the proposal to look like, what's the topic, give me X number of words to write an abstract, and it will do a very good job at actually creating a first draft. So it's not gonna be what you would ultimately turn in, but it provide, and we all know how difficult the first draft is sometimes just to, <laughs> to get it off the ground. Um, so this is a really helpful, could be helpful crutch depending on the kinds of work that you're trying to put in as proposals. There are other aspects of proposals that it also is very helpful for, like say, write me a research data management plan. I tried that one, it was also very helpful, you know, also needed tweaks and such, but it was, it came up with a, you know, seven point plan, all the things that the NSF would tell you to cover, uh, chat GPT uh, at least had a preliminary answer to. Um, it's good at writing summaries. So if you put in a longer text, now in the free version of chat GPT, there are some word and character limits, so you have to be mindful of that. But you can put in, you know, a fair amount of text. I can't remember. Someone else probably knows maybe up to a thousand words or something and say, give me a summary in 500 words of this or 250 words. Um, and it can be iterative in that way as well. Like if you don't like the answer the first time, you can give it more specific direction to go back and revise. So that can be very useful. Um, you know, if maybe you have a longer version of a proposal and you need to write the executive summary or the abstract, like it can help you to pare it down and try to identify what the main ideas are. Um, it also can help summarize, say, meeting notes uh, and identifying next steps. Like if you put in, again, with the character limitations recognized, um, if you put in like your meeting notes and tell it to summarize, tell it to pull out 
uh, next steps or, you know, highlights that need to be attended to, it can do that. It will come back with like a numbered list. Like it seems like this meeting was focused on X, Y, Z. Here are the people who said they would do ABC. And so that is a, a useful purpose, of, um, application of automation, I think as well. Um, one, so two more sort of general buckets. One is just, it can help with creative projects. So maybe it would give a boost to people who aren't professional programmers. Like it can also do coding and identify where people are making errors in their codes. Like if they're trying to accomplish a project, I have a colleague who um, had a particular project and she's not a uh, coder, an expert coder by any means, but she was trying to accomplish something and was able to put the code into, this was GPT-4, and it was able to identify where the errors were and to be able to correct it. And so she was able to kind of move through the process more quickly and more easily. So that can be more satisfying if you're trying to achieve a certain creative project. Um, I have used it myself for drafting a toast to a colleague or um, like trying to come up with some kind of creative poem or a limerick. Uh, it does a good job of that. You can tell it to do something in the style of a particular author or a particular genre. Um, so that's fun just to experiment with um, that can serve to spark your own creativity. This is one of the really interesting um, applications, I think, is that it can translate text. So not only from one language to another, but also from one register to another. So you can say you give it a, a summary of a research project that you're doing and say, please write this in the style of an abstract that you would read in Nature, the journal. So it can do that kind of um, cultural uh, translation as well. That seems like a real advantage and perhaps a democratizing um, influence in a way. Like if you're a student, a postdoc who maybe English isn't your first language, you have great ideas that you want to express, but you're going to be hindered because you're not able to be as eloquent in English, say, if that's the language of publication, that chat GPT could be helpful in that way to get one's ideas out there. So finally, I just want to talk about policy, and maybe we can come back to this as well, and thinking about how universities are treating this now. It's a relatively new development, and universities aren't known for being very um, nimble <laughs> necessarily in creating new policy, but some people are. And in fact, Berkeley Law, I'll put the link in the chat, um, recently introduced a policy just last week, I think, uh, around use of these generative AI models specifically in advance of finals. So they were looking at it in terms of um, you can't use it for anything that could be construed as plagiarism. A lot of the conversation is defined around these kind of punitive measures and you know, looking at it as a source of plagiarism. Um, I think it would be great if we can also think about it as a source of creativity and you know, helping to generate new ideas. Um, so Berkeley Law is leading. I think it's the first uh, law school to put out any kind of policy. I was looking around a little bit at other institutions and they were um, just giving kind of general cautions like, each faculty member should decide his or her policy for themselves. Uh, it should, you know, adhere to academic honesty principles. Um, so that's sort of the, the realm that it's being cast in right now. But I hope that we will look at it um, also for what it can provide and to teach students also what it can provide. You know, there's this whole new um, uh, discipline perhaps of prompt engineering, you know, like how do you work with chat GPT to give it the kinds of prompts that are going to get you the answers that you want. So I will pause there and turn it over to my co-panelists. I think, Janae, you're next on the list. Yes, thank you for your opening the conversation, Camille. And I just want to say thank you again to everyone who's here um, listening and processing all this information. It's exciting to get to explore tremendous developments in technology in a variety of contexts. And I think you're gonna hear a lot of overlapping themes that I hope can be applicable to the work and context that you're coming to this conversation with today. And certainly I'd be eager to understand how you're orienting to this um, really hot topic right now as well. So I'm gonna speak from my perspective as the executive director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, though I'll also be simultaneously speaking from my perspective as a scholar of digital rhetoric and writing, um, because this topic really is, I think, a tremendous development in how we at universities um, help members of the community understand how to align technology usage 
um, with their pedagogy, how to think critically about the role that technology plays in the classroom and in the learning experience. Um, concerns of technology have been a part of education essentially since the foundation of formal schooling has begun. Um, I always like to sort of harken back to actually the sort of the advent of like mass publishing in these kinds of conversations and the ways that um, scholars sort of like wrung their hands over like what the implications of sort of mass literacy would be um, and how that would sort of challenge or threaten certain notions of knowledge production or knowledge making. So we're in the newest iteration of that. And of course, there's important specific dimensions of this moment, but I think it's important to frame with a little bit of historicization that like this is a new moment, kind of, but a lot of the sort of core issues around who has access to technology, um, what the implications of that technology are. Um, are very much shared, I think, in, in a sort of historic lens. So I'm also going to put in the chat um, sort of, first of all, a resource that the Center for Teaching and Learning has developed for Berkeley faculty about the opportunities and threats that are uh, available with the use of tools like ChatGPT in institutional contexts. I like to frame this conversation in the lens of opportunities and threats because I think it's a helpful way to take a step back and think about Again, what are the possibilities, things that you can do? And what are the concerns? What are the questions we should be asking ourselves critically um, before adopting any new technology? Um, one thing, again, I also like to bear in mind with any new emerging technology is that it's bound to change in a variety of different ways. So access may be free and easily, ubiquitously accessible now, but we know for certain Microsoft has plans to monetize certain versions of ChatGPT. Competitors will likely jump in and do the same. And so as we think about learning context in particular, we want to be mindful that it's possible not all students will have equal access um, to these tools that might give them opportunities to think about their writing in different ways. I think Camille already opened us up with a number of really great concrete ideas about the opportunities for ChatGPT, that it's great for generating and brainstorming ideas. It's really wonderful at making explicit a lot of the tacit genre moves um, and structure of pieces of writing that students do have to produce in academic settings, right? It's great at writing uh, a cover letter. It's great at writing a generic lab report. It's great at writing a classic five paragraph essay. Um, and so it can be nice to have exercises with students, right? Where they use ChatGPT to produce these genres and critique them, right? What do you notice when ChatGPT produces um, a five paragraph essay? What are the moves it's making? What are you as a reader experiencing as you look at the output from ChatGPT? Um, and what's just what's happening there, right? What's the tone of ChatGPT? What is it communicating to you? Um, I think that when we talk about some of the concerns that some academics have as, you know, for using ChatGPT for cheating, academic dishonesty, um, it comes out of a real focus on the product, right? When we worry about academic dishonesty, we're thinking about how students may be producing genres that they did not authentically write themselves, and we're most interested in assessing that product. But so much of learning is about process. Um, students are going to cheat no matter what. That might be a hot take, but it's a full stop <laughs> reality. Um, and so the question is, how do you mitigate some of that impact? And how do you help the learning itself be meaningful? Because students cheat, and I want to refer, there's a great book by James Lang called Cheating Lessons that was published in 2011, I want to say. So it's been out for a while. Um, but we want to think about why students cheat. And students will often cheat if they only think they're being graded on a final product um, and that product's really high stakes and they're nervous about it, right? People take shortcuts when they think process and learning doesn't really matter or they don't have time or capacity to do it. So that should give educators some pause. I think rather than policing and surveilling, um, we have an opportunity to think about what conditions can we create in our classrooms to mitigate cheating, knowing Again, that cheating is, is probably going to occur. Um, oh, thank you, Jill, for putting that link in the chat. And I appreciate other folks just putting links in the chat as we go as well. It's helpful. Um, think about what conditions can we make to make learning feel as safe and as valuable as possible? That might mean creating smaller, low stakes assignments that scaffold to a larger end product um, to build that. So that's, again, an opportunity. You could use ChatGPT to build that scaffolding to an end product um, if you so choose. I'm already dipping a little bit into the threats, but I do want to state explicitly that there really are some threats and concerns at ChatGPT that before we sort of enthusiastically embrace all the possibilities, we have to be aware that ChatGPT may not, may not be accessible to all users. Um, 
I know that locally at Berkeley IT, um, folks have not um, necessarily tested all the iterations of ChatGPT. And um, in terms of educational guidelines, we tend to rely upon our local accessibility testing to ensure that the products we use and teach are compliant. Um, so I'd say that if you're in a position where you're teaching or wanting to teach with ChatGPT, um, I would very much recommend making it an option rather than a requirement, right? Because you never want students to feel like they have to use a tool that hasn't been tested or sanctioned by the institution if they can't access or use it. Um, similarly, there are major privacy implications and we're thinking about teaching and learning contexts. We have to make sure again, that the, the space is really safe for students to feel like they can express themselves and learn and engage with appropriately. And we don't know how data, or I don't know, maybe someone here can tell me <laughs> how the data that ChatGPT is, uh, how, how they're using the data that's been entered into ChatGPT, um, right? So if students are entering in personal data or personal identifying information, um, there's no guarantee that's going to be kept personal. And um, at a university, we should really be working hard to think about how we keep students intellectual work again as safe as possible. So again, creating optionality and choices where you can because there's still so much more room to grow and understand what's possible um, with ChatGPT. The other threat to just think about here before I um, reference one more resource and then pass the mic to our final panelist, Greg, um, is just to kind of think about um, what it means to engage with a tool that was trained on a limited data set um, that may not be able to capture um, the lived experiences and perspectives of students in the classroom that may be meaningful and that may homogenize or undermine those perspectives. For example, ChatGPT is going to privilege standard academic English, which maybe um, have some high social capital in academia, um, but, but may not be true to students' um, sense of belonging in the classroom, um, nor might it honor the linguistic diversities that we may want students to express and appreciate in their writing. Um, for example, Latinx rhetorics, Black rhetorics, um, maybe useful languages and experiences we may want to draw upon um, in writing and ask students to invoke. And again, ChatGPT is going to homogenize that to become pretty much, again, standard academic English. And as a data set, at least ChatGPT was built on a data set from Reddit, right? And we know the demographics of Reddit are not representative of the demographics of the world, <laughs> anything but. Um, so I would just reflect on that implication, again, if you sort of choose to use it in certain contexts or ways, it's it's going to whitewash certain kinds of language, just to be really frank about it. Um, where I will end is by saying that there's a lot of great think pieces right now about the pedagogical commi commitments educators should have with ChatGPT. And so I don't want to advocate for putting our heads in the sand, putting up our blinders, banning and pretending this doesn't exist. That has never worked. It's not going to do anyone any good. Um, so what I think we can commit to, again, is a critical lens. Think about how do we honor process in learning? How do we honor students' lived experience? And how do we help students and faculty alike, everyone, approach ChatGPT with a critical lens to recognize what it can do, what it can't do, and what are the ways that this technology can impact how we learn and what the merits are of imagining a world with large language models informing human thought. I'll go ahead and pass to Greg. Thank you. Oh, this is, uh, wow, this is great to, to, to follow um, Camille and Janae. Um, uh, I want to go under the hood a little bit, so to speak, um, but this is not deep and it's going to loop right back around to the themes you just heard about from my, my two excellent co-panelists. So I like to do that by just um, take an example of, you know, imagine one of these you know, free for now demos of, um, you know, ChatGPT or, or Dolly or Stable Diffusion, these various uh, uh, new manifestations that, that we can access on the web. Um, let's look at what's what's behind one of them. If you go way to the way to the back, way to the core, you will find these um, what are called models. And the, the model is um, basically it, it, it was a very large computer job that took several million computer hours to run in these current manifestations. And its task was to take basically you know, language. Uh, so think of like the prompt, you know, what is a prompt, it's language and associate it with features of that media set. So, um, you know, it, 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 if it's text, chat GBT, it's, it's how, does, how is, does text appear? Uh, or if it's images, how does, 
prompt style text is uh, associated with images or if it's music or, or what have you. Um, so this, this very enormous computer job creates a, a result, and that's a result that one can uh, interact with programmatically. Um, but at that stage, and I played with some of them, they're, they're, they're not that fun. Uh, um, they're not that they're not horrible, but they're, they're not the same as, as that final product you're seeing on these web demos, right? Um, why is that? Is because when you go to one of these web demos, there's there's application and features in between that core model and the interface you've got. And um, uh, Janae, you mentioned tone, right? So um, so uh, quite literally, Chat GPT as one example, it was after this core model was made, it was had a couple phases of training um, with, with real human. Um, uh, 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 hired humans you know, input to, to, to help it learn or actually to add behavioral features that, that made it conversational, right? Uh, and, and to made it a, make it a friendly chatting partner, right? And so, um, uh, and, and other features between your web front end and this back language model or image model, whatever it is, um, yeah, also include uh, things like um, filters, perhaps for content in and for content out. Uh, and sometimes uh, Bing is one uh, uh, popular example. Bing is basically chat GPT uh, kind of in parallel with real-time web searches. So the application in between you and chat GPT uh, does some of this other stuff I mentioned and then also integrates. You know, and, and you get the same thing for like a the, the notion that folks are starting to deploy these for like question and answer bots for you can imagine undergraduate admissions or, or some tech helpline for some product. Um, you, you want this this general knowledge uh, chatter helpful bot that has also access to your documentation, right? Um, and so th these are kind of integrated. Um, now, when 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 you're when you're talking or prompting with 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 one of these tools, um, that's a lot of these have sort of kind of kind of for free, or you're not getting charged. Um, but th they also have to run on expensive computer hardware. Um, one little prompt isn't as big as the initial training run, but it's running on. Uh, uh, on expensive hardware, and then you multiply by by millions of users, and and that that's a lot of expense. First of all, um, I'm going to come back to this expense and, and some implications there. Um, uh, a couple other measures. Um, in my experience, uh, it's this isn't a you know an explicit survey, but just my real world uh, anecdotal experience with a graduate student saying, "Hey, I need to do an experiment for a paper, you know, in machine learning." They might need 10, 20, 50, 100,000 hours in a month, you know, of, of expensive computer time, and 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 they'll they'll make those computers busy for 100,000 hours that month. So they need a lot of them, and they need them now. And and there's interesting discussions about, um, uh, you know. How, how how they can get access to that to do this work right um and and i don't even know what's going to happen i think it's uh probably only a matter of time where we have someone in say a uh, uh, faculty in one of our data science classes say hey i need to update my curriculum and i need to have um uh you know this expensive hardware behind the homeworks and all the, the, the students need to access it and that's going to be 10 or 100 times more expensive than the current stuff um and it's not just dollars. Um, a lot of those dollars are paying for electricity. So we talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, several million computer hours to to train ChatGPT. So that's several million computer hours of 200, 300, 400 watt GPU chips that don't run just on their own. They're also in the computer, which takes more electricity in a data center, which has all this cooling. So the, the um, yeah, it, it just it just uh, it, it's it's a big energy impacts as well, and then um, you know th these access. Uh, some of my colleagues talk here on the panel talked about sort of the you know individual can can who can who can pay um, you know the sort of the I'll call it that it's no amount of money is trivial, but the sort of small pays you go fee like a sort of subscription twenty dollars a month or something like that. But it, you know if you're that graduate student you know and and you need you know. I, I need $200,000 of compute this month to do my work. You know, who gets that or who's made that big hardware investment? Um, who gets it and who doesn't? And maybe different disciplines. We know that different disciplines across academy are funded to different levels. And so who can do this kind of work? Because I think there's people who are not just, you know, computer scientists who, who are doing this. Um, and there, there are so many layers of, of, of uh, ethics, um, there's the access. There's the there's the um, how these tools are used, um, and also uh, you've heard again from some of my panelists the notions of representation. So 
even though these, these tools are trained on uh, usually billions of examples of sample data, um, imagine, you know, I, I saw someone's uh, a demonstration of, hey, we can make an, uh, uh, a chat bot for employees that answers questions about HR. And um, uh, uh, it, it's, um, oh, hang on, I lost my, lost my train of thought here. So the, I've um, uh, got too much going on. I, uh, um, let, 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 let me let me let me come back to that. Um, so the the uh, yeah so uh, representation issues. Um, uh, the, the, these big data sets. There's there's questions of what gets into that data set. Right here, here's the HR train of thought. I apologize. So um, uh, uh, oh no, I'm taking myself in the loop. So I think I need some help here. Um, uh, let me continue on. So, so the, these these tools are also uh, not uh, omniscient. Uh, they don't care. They just remix and regurgitate what went into them. So you you might have uh, you know uh, Reddit is not the worst of what's in Chat GPT. There's stuff that's a lot worse, and there's there's stuff that's not integrated into there. Um, and then uh, you get the questions of privacy. Um, when you talk about some of these other tools that folks are talking about building with these with these chats, these chat bots, you might have something where uh, you know a student logs in to, to do some student services stuff, and that chat bot then accesses student records. And these things are in a sense so complicated; they're not like traditional flowcharts the way they work, where you might build in safeguards in your logic. Um, they have so many pieces and are such statistical things that does someone make just the right prompt and gets information about you know other students and so on and so. Um, there, there's, there's a lot, a lot to think about here. Um, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. But um, yeah, I think uh, uh, this is, uh, this is, this is fascinating stuff. Thank you, Greg. I think it's now time to uh, start the, uh, the discussion portion of the event. Um, uh, the audience, if you have questions, please uh, type it into the chat box. Uh, and uh, we will read them as, uh, you know, if it's kind of a, a, appropriate and uh, useful for the audience. Uh, I have a question to start off with, and it's something Camille, uh, you, you wrote down on the chat. Um, it's a, kind of a nuts and bolts in the weeds question. It is, how do we pay for all this? Are we going to get money from the government or, uh, yeah, how do, from overhead for administrative work or to research to educational uh, uh, projects. How, how are we going to pay for this all? It sounds very expensive, as Greg alluded to. So I'll, I'll give it to the uh, the panelists to talk about this. Yeah, I'd love to see some analysis of that. Um, and I'm sure various CFOs are making uh, economic models for what the needs are going to be. Uh, I hope that many of you have probably also been involved in writing NSF proposals or helping faculty members to build their budgets for such proposals. Um, and there's already been some questions around um, how it's treated by NSF. So this is kind of a policy question for NSF as well, um, because sometimes it had been preferable just to buy a lot more equipment because that was excluded from from the overhead rate versus if you were buying services when that was included. Um, so again, this is very in the weeds for you know research administration. But uh, I would be curious now that this is becoming more and more um, popular as a tool, and as Greg mentioned, you know at very high uh, energy intensive um, rates. How is that going to be treated by the by the grant makers as well? And I think that I want to underscore the energy piece too. I would be very curious to see how it's being um, evaluated by like sustainability offices or again, the uh, finance offices, uh, because I imagine it will have some impact at least until the engineers figure out how to uh, reduce the energy consumption needed to do some of these big, um, from these big models. I, I can give this a couple of real world examples to compare Camille and for everyone. Um, uh, we had a researcher who says, I, I need 500 of these GPUs for 30 days. We didn't have them. We tried to help them get access. But basically, I did some back of the envelope and that would I have a, a, an older home that's not very energy efficient. It would take care of all of my energy needs for half a century for yeah. their one month experiment <laughs> or or are charged 10, 10 Teslas, 10,000 miles a year for 10 years. That's one month, and and for one and faculty talk, member, right? <laughs> one project, one faculty, one experiment, and I and, yeah. and I talked to a vendor who sold um, uh, ten times that many GPUs to one of the big social media companies in in one purchase event. So this is the energy is very tremendous. 
So I, I think, yeah, this is a brand new territory. I, I'm sure IT folks here will be uh, doing some analysis in the near future uh, because I, I think that can exponentially increase our current IT spend, which is a good and bad thing maybe. Um, I think maybe following up to that is, well, I mean, I want to ask the panel, are there additional questions you have for each other? There were so many points that I think uh, uh, we can explore further from um, the educational policy lens to the administrative lens and the benefits. I do want some, in some ways want to emphasize uh, that we, we should talk about the benefits more so than the, the negatives at times, because I think the, a lot of the discussion is on the cheating issue purely and also, uh, you know, and the wider discussions about how AI would destroy humanity. But I do think there's a lot of immediate value that I think we want to capture in this discussion. So um, is, is there other thoughts about um, other people's thoughts? I, I'm curious. I, I, I don't know to, to what extent. I mean, that I, I figure that that um, in, in the education space, uh, working with students, that um, that that for them to use these tools thoughtfully, they have to understand, you know, how they work at some level. And I don't know if there's if, if we have infrastructure to do that sort of systematically, or does that fall to sort of you know instructor to instructor, or I don't know how that might have come to happen. I don't know if others have ideas. I'll let Janae jump in, but I agree with you. I'm also curious about how um, how it's being used creatively and proactively with students to um, to help them understand it, because I think it's a tool that's not going to go away. And so we need to grapple with how are we going to use it effectively and ethically. Um, but Janae, I'm sure you have concrete ideas. Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple different dimensions here. It's a good question, Greg, about how do students have equal access to the, I mean, for lack of a better word, training on how to use ChatGPT effectively. Because there you do actually have to have some sophistication. Camille mentioned prompt engineering. That feels 100% like an emerging area. Um, I would say that there are not, at least again, to my knowledge, and someone maybe in the chat can correct me if I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, there is no existing infrastructure to support this kind of digital literacy education for students in any systematic level um, in the university. Uh, perhaps at other institutions, but I haven't heard of any good examples yet. In general, I think universities have struggled with various digital literacy gaps for a very long time. I think um, if there's any place on a campus that's helping students understand how the internet works, how to search for things effectively, how to use effective online tools is actually the library. I think they're probably the number one place on campus, it helps students think about research, that helps give students skills to find information they need to form their academic knowledge. But gosh, if there is also a place on campus that's extremely um, under-resourced, it's also the library. Um, so, and I know students are protesting the closure of a library as we speak. So uh, go libraries, <laughs> it's gonna be one editorialization here because they could be a place actually that we could lean more heavily into to understand um, the framing, the knowledge of mind, the information architecture, and the information management that would be necessary to become an adept user of generative AI. So that's 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 a pitch I would make as kind of a place to house this sort of work. Um, I don't know if there are any librarians here, but that's mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's a partnership I'd love to think more about. Um, can we also ask a question about just like creative uses? in in the class. I think the discipline that I've seen that do the most creative application in this work so far is in computer science because there's so much energy, I think, in the software engineering sector to be doing hackathons and other such kind of thought leadership around um, ways to incorporate tools like ChatGPT into um, a software engineering workflow. So I know that there are computer science courses here at Berkeley that are asking students to experiment with ChatGPT as part of their assignments to think about where they fit into the code infrastructure. Um, I haven't seen this example at Berkeley, but certainly I know again, my colleagues in the humanities and other institutions are again having assignments where they're asking students to, you know, input certain prompts in the chat routine, ask their students to do almost like a literary analysis or kind of a rhetorical analysis of what they're noticing happen with the tool. Um, I'll put in the link in the chat in a moment with, um, there's a Google doc going from an educator named Anna Mills um, that has a really comprehensive database of assignment activities, editorial. She's been doing a very good job of stewarding a lot of these conversations about ChatGPT. So if that's the space you're interested in learning more about, um, Anna is certainly a good person to follow. 
Well, I also want to echo, um, echo that. Uh, I think in creative arts, there is actually a, a big wave of a new innovation happening. Uh, I don't know if people, Greg, you mentioned Dali and uh, uh, Stable stable Diffusion. And I think the other tool that's been very popular is called Mid Journey. So I think all artists going forward might be having have to use these tools to create new ideas and generate pieces alongside their traditional skill sets. Uh, it is scary for a lot of people, of course, because uh, uh, there's always been layoffs in certain industries because of uh, uh, in, like graphic design even and uh, in photography because of these new tools. Um, I do want to add here, uh, I think, I mean, Camille, I mean, some of you are on these, uh, I think, policy boards, uh, university boards or UCY boards to, to deal with AI. But is there a concern that it's moving so fast that um, it's hard to keep track? Should we do a more, do we have more panels like this and or more uh, additional working groups to figure this out because as you uh Jenny you alluded to earlier that there was um you know prompt engineering that seems like a new hot skill set and just today I heard about a new AI that does prompt engineering to prompt engineer for AI other like chat and other AI solutions so that might be a new job skill set that might be obsolete suddenly again so things are moving so fast really and um, and I also want to mention in the last month or so the auto G, uh, G, GPT and these solutions that I think are, um, you know, I think mind boggling, they, they can collaborate and do research like a team of humans. Um, so again, uh, what is the next in terms of the university administrative infrastructure to deal with this such a fast moving tool, tool set? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think there's a whole lot of research to be done, especially as these new GPTs are emerging that are trained on different kinds of data sets. Like, you know, Elon Musk is going to have his truth GPT. And there's another group that is um, training bots basically on uh, right-leaning material that's like Republican GPT and on left-leaning material that's liberal GPT, you know, so that you can kind of get the answers that you might be seeking, however much they may or may not be based in reality. Um, so that's sort of on the research side. Uh, as far as the policy side goes, I certainly think it would be worth having some thoughtful discussions with a multi-stakeholder group, you know, people who are computer scientists, who are privacy experts, who are the, you know, legal counsel, um, representatives from the faculty and from the libraries, et cetera, to think about should there be any kind of overarching policy around it? I think we're all agreed that, you know, we can put some additional clauses in our like academic honesty um, agreements that might refer to not using this in a way that would be considered plagiarism. But there are other aspects like I refer to in other parts of the university, like do we need to have a policy? Maybe not. I mean, decentralization anyway, it would be hard to have a kind of top-down um, policy about pretty much anything. But uh, it, I think it would merit some, some discussion from thoughtful folks. You know, I, I think personally, I, I think um, as we think about these tools, I, I think we need to, um, I think they're, it's, it's very seductive to give them too much credit um, because they, they seem pretty uh, amazing at first blush, but you spend a little time. And, and um, so I found that chat GPT, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't sort of argue its position. It was very fickle. I could get it to swing this way or swing that way, even when stuff you know wasn't true. It just always wanted to please me. And I said, I don't want that conversation partner. Or with stable diffusion, I know that people who who like bicycles a lot always sort of make a joke that um, I have n number of bicycles. The proper amount is n plus one. Always need a new bike. So stable diffusion, you put in n plus one, and you get lots of you get nothing but bicycle pictures. This is not what M plus one means to humanity. This is what it means in that data set, right? And, and I don't know that I like that. And um, uh, or, or when you click on um, uh, in, in the a fancier interface for stable diffusion, if you click on restore faces, because it doesn't do well to, our, to us to, to draw faces, you get a, a whole lot of pink lips and blue eyes um, and that doesn't reflect humanity. And, and so, so, what it is though good is at remixing and regurgitating what went in for better or worse. And, and so, you know, grant proposals, I think there's nothing wrong with informing your grant proposal by doing a draft for you because you're trying to make a document like, like the one that's been done hundreds of thousands of times before and give me a little help and help me uh, short, you know, start this. But, and, and, and I didn't, but but for sort of innovation or for in a sense you know some some you know an artist or a creator you know I I, I don't I don't I don't know that that's gonna 
these tools will replace those kind of roles in our in our society. Just want to ask if audience has additional questions they could type in. Um, Jenny, do you want to follow up with the conference, the discussion you were having with Jill about uh, um, citations and? Yeah, sure. I mean, so I'll just amplify. Jill had this really excellent question about, and I'll just read it for the sake of everyone, you know, if those who might not have access to the chat. How can ChatGPT hone critical thinking skills related to the citation issue, uh, but how do you validate the quality and accuracy? And I kind of asked a follow-up question, which was just like, are we asking about how we can encourage students themselves to validate the quality and accuracy of chat GPT's output? Um, and Jill sort of follows, follows up from that by asking, how do we engage students in assessing veracity versus over trust? Um, which I think sort of ties in exactly to Greg's point about um, perhaps kind of the, the, the fantasy of chat GPT's competency versus maybe like the reality of what it can actually do. Um, I think we could teach students the same kind of like fact checking exercises that I actually, um, this educator Mike Colfield has been kind of advocating for for a decade now. There have been concerns with kind of the veracity of online sources um, for quite some time, I think, in among information literacy circles um, and among folks who have been thinking about, you know, challenges with just students being able to verify sources they find on social media. Um, I think the same skills could be very useful with um, ChatGPT as well. Um, one strategy that Mike Holfield um, has written about, and again, I could put that resource in the chat, is something called lateral reading, where he suggests that um, you know when you find an article or if ChatGPT makes a reference, um, that you're like, huh, is that true? What can I learn about this information? Um, you know, just Google it, right? Look, uh, you know, lateral, the term lateral reading comes from you know opening other tabs in your browser, right? So see what else can you find about that piece of information from Wikipedia? What else can you find about that piece of information from your library database? What, what else are you just seeing in and around the web? You know, what are the variety and diversity of sources you can draw upon um, to verify the output you're getting from ChatGPT? Like recognizing and framing, acknowledging mm -hmm. that ChatGPT is, um, is one data set, but again, a library is a, is a data set um, that's curated, right? And both of these, I mean, and the, and the, really the overlap is ChatGPT is ultimately curated by humans, even though it's trained by robots. Um, so are library databases, so are search engines. So it, it's sort of worth, I think, thinking about uh, like sort of lifting the curtain for students and saying that you need to look across multiple sets of databases. And it sounds like that's a time consuming process. It's it's not. Um, it can be something you do in five minutes just to verify across a different source. Um, and yes, I, Jill, I appreciate this reference about, yeah, can kind of like this do library resource that it does absolutely hallucinate <laughs> um, sources, right? So it's always worth kind of fact checking and verifying that the sources are real. Um, and again, I think Mike Caulfield's approach around lateral reading is really helpful. We're doing that so again i'll find that source i'm happy to put in the chat i'm curious if there are other thoughts about this but that's how i would engage with that question um we have a great question from asia regarding uh if chat gp uses it as a service point could users access humans during the interaction process uh how does it resolve concerns with staffing uh i, I have a follow-up question related to that too in a gray it's, it's really staffing on these services if we do have uh, use ChatGPT as a service point for for student records and so forth. How does that impact staffing in general? I mean, uh, because it might automate so many tasks that requires a lot of the currently people's analyst roles, if you will. Um, it is a, I think, a concern for a lot of folks um, and, and the service quality itself. So I want to open that up to the the the, the panel to just talk about. We, sometimes I, I, I'm 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 kind of a, a, a skeptic. I, I think these things do have their roles in these these sort of you know administrative functions and so on. But imagine you're you're, you're trying to to hire hire someone for some role that that's a I'll call it customer facing role, and you ask about their experience doing it. And then imagine just pretend you could interview um, the the sort of chatbot that you're going to integrate into your application, and they say their qualifications is that I I've I've I, I came to life and the first thing I did was I read a billion documents on the internet, plus also our policies. I'm ready to go. Let me help. And I'd say, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that said, um, uh, I've talked to some folks uh, um, 
at you know at, at one of the cloud providers who's who's working with the campus on 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 building tools and and they they do need um uh domain experts to 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 prep the documentation to go alongside the chat and to then do a higher level of training on how it behaves uh, for that purpose. And um, you know, I and I, I don't really know what the that that's not trivial work. It's not the programmer can't deliver this product alone, right? And and I don't really know what the balance is. Is this worthwhile to do it this way? You know, Camille, you talked about sometimes 24-7 access might might be of high value, right? You know, but but is is the tool lower quality and just as expensive in, in, in other senses? I, I I think it's probably gonna be case by case. Yeah, I think and we can talk over about time of costs going down too. Right. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, I was thinking about um, GPTs, not just the chat GPT interface that we might have already experimented with, but like using this idea for domain specific applications. So like Aisha was asking about um, the mental health example. And I what I think would probably happen is that some company is going to take the idea of chat GPT and modify it for their own platform so that then they would customize it as to certain keywords that would flag a human um, you know, to get that kind of intervention. Some AI programs are already doing that. You don't really need a GPT to, to do that. There are already some that are doing that. Um, but like also thinking about the healthcare example, like they're the health centers across UC are sitting on tons of data, you know, and here again, the privacy considerations and HIPAA considerations would have to come into play. But you, I could imagine that, you know, like writing up doctor's notes, uh, you know, check-in visits, like all of that radiology reports say um, could be expedited. And I've used this myself as well, when uh, copying a very technical kind of jargony report from say a radiologist, you can plug that into chat GPT and say, give me a layperson's rendering of what this is saying. And it does that very well. So that like, as far as a patient advocacy kind of example um, could also be useful. Yeah, and, and and these services are available today. I mean, I, I had a talk earlier this week, you know, where the um, you know, some higher level person from Microsoft was, you know, talking to an education audience and like, you know, you need to start building your applications now. What can you build in thirty days? What can you build before the summer? So this is a, a building block that's the the, the OpenAI's Chat GPT that's available today. Pay as you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever your creativity allows, for better or worse. Yeah, yeah building block. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, because it really requires the application in front of it and alongside. Right. Yeah. So uh, one of the questions I also have is, Greg, you keep on mentioning Microsoft and uh, and our, we have various partners that uh, have, you know, new AI tools to sell to us. But does it make sense to break it to develop some, uh, utilize some open source solution to uh, and create our own tools? Because, you know, at Berkeley, we're very proud of our some of our platforms like Data Hub, which is developed internally. Uh, and and should a academia itself try to create something that's uh, not beholden to some of the big cloud providers, uh, which we have for, for certain services. So thoughts on kind of this? Well, I, I think that's always the, the kind of question one should ask when, when, when working on, a, 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 a say, a new computing service is, you know, to what extent um, do we, you know, especially given the cloud, to what extent, you know, we don't, we don't, um, these days, it's rare that we, you know, buy parts and build a computer and then start to use it. Sometimes we buy the computer ready to go. Sometimes we don't buy the computer; we buy a virtual computer. Or sometimes we we, we purchase time on a higher level service and so on. So when the higher level service is more ready to go out of the box for you, it can be very cost efficient to jump in there. When it when when it when it you know can't even be bent or, and modified to do your task, then it's especially you know, time to maybe look at where on that stack you, you start to customize. So I think it's kind of always a question. I don't know that there's a there's one answer, but it's important to ask every time, I think. Well, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, does the panelists, do they, you have any last words for the audience? Oh, well, I'll go first. And I would say just experiment, you know, jump in and try it, see what applications occur to you, um, read about how other people are using it, and uh, you'll get lots of good ideas, I think, and also be um, maybe more informed about like where the scary parts are and what you don't need to be so concerned about. Thank you for having me. It was really fun to, to talk with all of you. Yeah, I want to underscore um, Camille's point about kind of open-mindedness and 
just to say that you know, there's so much energy around this topic and um, I would love to see there be more coordination and partnership, right? Um, with folks who are looking at a lot of shared questions and issues. So I'll just kind of make this an open invitation. Of course, if you are interested in kind of connecting or thinking um, more collaboratively about potentials, particularly in education, um, I would love to connect with you. Thank you. And I would say, you know, be, be ever ever skeptical. I, not not that these things are are useless, but what are they? What aren't they? What what do they sort of mean? I'm also kind of cautiously waiting for for some maybe big embarrassments in the coming months, where 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 the hype doesn't get delivered on. So I think trying to understand, you know, for any person's role or or, or task, you know, what 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 these can do for you, what they can't, and what you need, you know, is just taking that careful thought and not rushing through with the hype. It's probably very important. Awesome. Well, I, I want to thank Camille, Jenny, and Greg. Uh, you guys have been amazing. And I feel like this is part of a long-term conversation. We probably should do a few more panels every few months, given how fast mm -hmm. things are changing. And if the audience, uh, yeah, round of applause, virtual applause. Uh, if the audience has questions uh, or suggestions for the future, future of uh, future panels, uh, or building community, let us know. Uh, just feel free to email us. But this wraps up this very first uh, Berkeley Cloud Meetup panel on AI. And uh, we hope to see you at the next meeting next month. All right. Thanks, everybody.